Welcome to episode 68 of the Camerosity Podcast, the world's number one open source film photography podcast. My name is Mike Ekman, and today is the first day of April. It's been a busy news day today in the photography industry. Hey Theo, what's this I hear about Nikon buying Minolta and reviving that brand? What kind of Minolta cameras do you think Nikon will start making again? Well, I think it's exciting on two fronts. One is they'll start making the Maxims and the Dynexes and all those kind of cameras again, which is great from Minolta's point of view, but they also get Konica, which means they start to make photocopiers just like Canon. Paul, don't you have any trips planned soon? If so, you might want to try out the Trolley Flex, a new design in luggage shaped like a Rolly Flex. Well, you know, I was thinking, I looked at it. The problem is it's too big. So I'm waiting for the baby Trolley Flex. That'll fit in the overhead. And Anthony, didn't you say you wanted to try a Leica M11? Maybe the new Leica M11H, the hybrid digital camera with a Huawei smartphone in the back. It just might be a bit more affordable. What do you think? You know, I'd kind of sworn off all Leicas, but this one really has me uh, intrigued because, uh, you know, I could I could dump my iPhone and uh, just travel with my Leica all the time. I think that would be, you know, the, the best camera is the camera that you have on you. So that would be uh, killing a couple of birds with one stone. That's true. Well, enough of news. We have a bunch of people in the waiting room. Let's let them in. Good evening. Ooh, I hear a familiar voice. How y'all doing? Is that Dan? That's Dan Tamarkin, live and in person. Hi, guys. Welcome back. The gang, thank you. The gang's all here. You know, I looked at the last episodes you were on. You were on episode 22. You were on episode 44. So we should have had you back on 66, but oh. we're, we're a little late. Every uh, every 22nd episode, Dan Tamarkin appears on the Rusty podcast, <laughs> uh, but not this time. We have Bob Rodoloni. Bob's back. Long time no see. Yep, I'm here. All right. Mark Faulkner is back. Hey, Mark. Patrick Casey. Welcome back, Patrick. Hello. Ray Nason again. Hey. Alan Perez. The, the famous Alan Perez. That's, I'm here to defend myself. Okay. He's real. I can see him. And uh, I also see my friend Johnny Martyr. Johnny, welcome to show. Hey, guys. Nice to nice to join you. Awesome. I've uh, I've met Johnny before. I flew out in 2001. He Johnny lives in Frederick, Maryland, and I went out there to visit Mark and Adam Paul. And uh, while I was there, I tried to check off as many people from my camera uh, travels wish list that I wanted to meet with. And I met Ira Cohen on that trip. And I ended up meeting Johnny. We went out to a little bar, a little brewery, and uh, and had a couple brews. And we gave away a camera to what was it, the bartender's daughter or something? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, really cool. I guess uh, were you with Mark? I guess going a little camera shopping at the local antique shops. He he picked up a few cameras, and I don't know how we ran into this girl, but uh, it was really generous. Uh, Mark gave gave her a camera he just bought and showed her basically how to use it. <laughs> It was like a Mamiya, wasn't it? Like a MSX or yeah. something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Mamiya cool. SLR, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, Johnny, you know, I I mentioned coming on the show for quite a while and uh, you know, you're just super busy, but you know, it's great to see you finally here. While I think most people do know who you are, why don't you maybe for anybody who doesn't introduce yourself and just kind of, you know, tell us a little bit about what you do. Oh, geez. Yeah, I guess maybe part of the reason, too, why I haven't hung out with you guys before is just because I'm totally self-conscious. <laughs> Terrible at introductions and stuff. Yeah, 35 millimeter black and white uh, photography in Frederick, Maryland, as you mentioned. I, mean, I shoot a lot of weddings, uh, family portraits, and I try to do political events, concerts, uh, you know, sort of that type of thing, too. Uh, I, I work with my wife. She shoots digital, and she's an icon girl, and I... I'm famous around these parts as being a Leica guy, but I do shoot my Nikons too, and we can swap our lenses back and forth, and that's quite nice. Which Leicas do you primarily shoot? I am on a uh, two, two M6 TTLs and Barnex. Uh, my, you hear me probably talk about it way too much, but my, my 1930 1-3 conversion is probably one of my favorite cameras. I carry it almost every day. Now, lights famously would upgrade cameras back then. They'd add rage finders. They'd swap out flash synchronization if necessary. Do you know the era in which your your one was converted to a three? Or was that a recent conversion or something from way back then? Yeah, no. It, I, I purchased it um, a few years back. Uh, I, I was uh, picking up a 
repair order for my for my usual tech in Baltimore, who's unfortunately is uh, place is recently closed. And I um, was picking up some uh, equipment from him, and he happened to have it. I didn't realize how old it was, because I just uh, honestly um, I had like a three F, and then I had a three C, and you know I had these sort of recent models, uh, so I didn't know too much about these earlier ones when I purchased it. Following down the serial number with a buddy of mine who's more knowledgeable of these things, turned out that it was a 1930 and it had been converted probably around 1935, 36. Like it was, so it was originally a 1C and it was converted to a, a 3. Uh, when I wrote to Leica about the uh, serial number information, they told me that uh, the only thing that they had on it was the date that it that it left the factory, which was in 1936. They didn't have they didn't have like anything prior to that, so that was kind of interesting. Yeah. One one sort of quirk about it that I, I thought people seem to uh, maybe are interested in it has a little cutaway on the film gate and uh sort of you know you can always tell which camera uh, a frame came out of because it's got this little sort of fingerprint uh, hi johnny it's theo here it could talk to you hey theo in person for it yeah is there any particular reason why you've sort of tri- moved towards the the old likers because i know you do a lot of low light photography with weddings and so on so is that is that something that sort of helps with that kind of photography or is that or is that just something you'd like to use uh so uh, definitely the uh I, I use the m6 ctls for sure for low light stuff i don't use barnex for low light very much because the viewfinders are pretty dim i guess what happened is that i started the first like i purchased was a 3f and i wasn't really that into the sort of the flash clutter as i call it on, on the on those cameras because i don't use flash so i just didn't like the distraction of it so i moved to the 3c which was really clean but i wanted to i was shooting on nikon slrs for most of my paid work up until that point and then i was just amazed when i picked up the um barnack like as it was like wow these are really in terms of usability like they feel a lot like a modern camera and as you guys know they're they're you know they're kind of the basis for the layout of modern cameras so i guess that i just kind of fell in love with that so i just like the smallness and portability particularly the 1930 it just has like a way that it feels so i use those more for for more brightly lit <laughs> situations than the low light stuff uh if that answers your question but the m6 ctl um that's an amazing low light camera I, I love that johnny do you do you use the meter built into the camera yeah i do i get uh, sometimes i get slack from uh, veteran photographers for that but I, I like to emphasize especially for paid work i think it's important to be accurate but also just you know even for my stream of conscious daily kind of stuff um, I, I like to consult the meter but I, I i guess what i like to emphasize about that and and focusing is uh i think it's important to be able to walk into a scene and and guess what your focus and your exposure should be by eye and then to have an instrument to verify that as opposed to the other way around which i think is maybe what we tend to do when we're beginning we lean on the camera i like to do it myself and then verify with the camera that makes sense that makes perfect sense i mean i i agree with you i mean that's the i i bet i bought an m6 at the leica school in 1986 oh cool and i and i still use it uh with a black wetzlar oh that's great to me it's you know everybody gets everybody likes their own camera but to me the m6 was was the ultimate in the like a rangefinder system i mean it was just i i and, and oddly enough the one i dislike the most is the m3 <laughs> I, I just i just don't like the m3 I, I don't like the viewfinder i don't like the fact that it doesn't have 35 millimeter frames it just always bugged me the m2 was fine but the m6 is it has everything it has everything i need in a viewfinder yeah actually it's it's funny you bring that up i i keep uh sort of i have i haven't uh, finished it yet, but I, I keep kind of working on a uh, M3 roast article roasting the M3 <laughs> because there's a lot of things that that's going to go over well. I know, I know. I you know, I like I like the terms up. The uh, the M3, you know, obviously is a historically significant and great camera, but I, I could I could not shoot weddings with an M3. I could not do what I do, like doing the work the way that I do it personally, anyway, with an M3. The M6, uh, specifically the M6 TTL, is I think just the perfect camera for me in fact i think i i think mike maybe like we met online maybe in part because i had written an article that sort of angered a lot of people you had written the conica 3 and you referenced my site a bunch of times and i was like who's this guy oh. <laughs> and i contacted you and then at that point i was already talking to mark and adam i'm like oh we know him okay and, and that 
and that was that was it. But I think I know where you're going. I probably screwed up your your segue there. But no, I, I maybe, maybe I was just thinking about the uh, the the camera blogger community in general seemed to sort of catch wind of me when I wrote an article professing my love for the M6 TTL. It was sort of a hyperbole, humorous, meant to be humorous article, but um, a lot of people got really angry by it. <laughs> And I want to come back to a couple of things you said, but while we were talking, we had another person join. Brock, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> name's Brock, uh, Northern Michigan, and uh, just like cameras. The one thing I want to touch back, you said, Johnny, when you were talking about how you couldn't use the M3 for what you do, you said, for how I shoot, for how I do it. And I think that's a, a very, very valid point that a ton of people miss especially when they start to talk about liking one model over another, or maybe they don't like a model that's very popular, or maybe they do like, you know, something like that. I think that everybody has kind of their own way of doing things. I'm similar to you. And like what Paul said too, I don't shoot slide film because I, 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 I don't want to rely on a meter. I prefer just guessing to me. That's part of the fun. You know, I don't shoot professionally like you do. I don't shoot even as much as Anthony does. You know, I have, I have a blog and I'm on a p- podcast and I probably shoot less film than half the people on, on this show, but it's because I do things a certain way and you do too. And I think that that's really valid. And a lot of things people will miss like, well, what do you mean you don't like the M3 or what do you mean you don't have a handheld meter or what do you mean you don't shoot this way or that way or something like that. And, and that's all fine and dandy for, for how they do it. But like the way you do it is, is a certain way and it works for you. And I think that that's, that's, that's really valid in, 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 in what should be taken into consideration when people talk about one model over another. Yeah, Mike, I, I completely agree with that. And that, that's actually, I, I'm glad you elaborated on that because I, I was, I was kind of hinting at that. I, I love, I love talking cameras. I love comparing one model to the other. And uh, as much as you guys probably do, well, I know you do. And, and I, I, I enjoy that too. I, I'm not as much of a collector as you guys, but I, I, I read all your posts and listen to the podcast and i and i love the back and forth and and comparing things but i think that a lot of confusion or maybe not confusion but disagreement can come out of this sort of how how we base the comparisons i'm actually i'm working on an article about clip on light meters right now the little accessory issue light meters that are popular right now i think there's a lot of them out there just like cameras and people you know compare them based on specs but what the, what a lot of comparisons aren't made for or made made by is uh, how we use this this stuff and what our intentions are and our purposes like if if you want to not use a meter and and shoot a few shots a day sunny 16 do things a little slower more deliberate like that that's a, just a different style and so you're gonna maybe want like different cameras different tools for that that purpose so so uh switching over to dan mr dan uh, have you ever heard of this Johnny Martyr guy? Is he uh is he is he someone you're familiar with? I sure have heard of him. I've never met him, but we've we've talked uh I think we talked on the phone. We've definitely talked over email. Yeah. And uh oh absolutely. And I, I also uh subscribed to his I subscribed to his newsletter. I subscribed to his blog, <laughs> which uh, which is terrific, and I would encourage uh, uh, y'all to subscribe to. I don't uh, I, I don't happen to know exactly the address. Yeah, it's a uh, it's Johnny Martyr at word, WordPress dot com. But yeah, th- thanks thanks for your thanks for your continued support, Dan. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely! It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. The articles are terrific, and I I think you have a great sense of humor. You know, back to that that just for a moment, back to that. Uh, first M6 TTL article you wrote, just for the record, I want to say that I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> oh, that's that's really uh, good. That makes me glad. I got so many like hate messages after that. Oh, I know. But... <laughs> I know people but... people can be very opinionated, and I think that uh, both you and Mike just touched on on you know a very important thing in in photography, and I think in uh, other aspects of life as well, which is there's not really a right or a wrong. It's what's right for you. Mm-hmm. Or what's wrong for you? I happen not to like the M3 myself. I mean, the viewfinder of the M3. Mm-hmm. I'm an M2 guy. Oh, okay. Well, you know, Johnny, it was, it's interesting because you use the TTL, though you don't use flash. And the the, the reason I, 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 I have an M6 because I have an M6, but I'd rather have a TTL only because it has three diodes rather than two. Yeah, yeah. On an, M3, on an M6 and you see one diode, you don't know if you're a half stop off or five f stops off from from correct on the on the M6 TTL you got three diodes so you got to, you you know when you're getting close to being right if you want to over or under expose a half a stop it's very easy to do yeah that's a really good point back to Dan's comment on the the M3 and the M2 
also i think it was like the the m2 really solidified i think the the viewfinders to come so i think that that makes a lot of sense but it has the sort of the that old school like a hand built what is it a just and fit build quality that the, the m3 is also known for so I, I can appreciate the love for the m2 there as far as the m6 versus the m6 ttl yeah i don't use flash a lot of people i think maybe because of the namesake with the m6 ttl people associate it with flash i i, I think I've probably never even put flashes on, on either one of them, so I'm not even sure <laughs> if they work. I don't know. I like I said, I was a Nikon guy. I was shooting. I always wanted to be a rangefinder guy, and I had little cheapies here and there. But I, I um, uh, I don't know. Just sort of fell into the Nikon ecosystem and was doing that mostly at first. But they have the three LEDs too. The the FM uh, series has the th uh, uh, FM series, and the uh, late F2 series have the three LED diodes that you mentioned. And so I guess when I was selecting a Leica, that was important to me was to sort of remain consistent with what I was used to. One of the things I talk a lot about is the importance of muscle memory. And part of the reason I love Leica so much is because they're just so consistent across history with their features and layouts. I think muscle memory is like super important to just reacting fast uh, for, you know, for uh, the type of work that I do. But it's funny that I bring up consistency because the M6 CTL, the thing that sort of throws people on it is the, the shutter speed rotates the opposite direction. It's in line with their digital series of cameras so if you shoot like a digital you're probably more happy with a, a m6 ctl or m7 analog um, whereas all the other like as the uh, shutter speed dial rotates the opposite way so that throws johnny you mentioned the, the nikons that you use um and the fm fm2 is there a particular reason why you're picking that camera as well i mean similar question to what i asked earlier but uh about the Leicas, but is there a particular reason you're picking that camera over say an f2 or or uh, f3 yeah, yeah. I'm pretty notorious for hating the F3. I can't, you can't see, I, I'm going to, I was going to say I can't see, but I'm going to widen that. <laughs> you can't see the uh, the meter readout in low light in that camera. Like so many people, when they shoot the F3 in low light, they rely on auto exposure to get the shot. And I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to lean on that. So I'm an F2 guy. I, I had the F3 first and I punted back to the F, F2SB specifically because I like to use pre-AI lenses. And I like that three meter or three uh, diode uh, LCD uh, metering, like we talked about. Um, I like to use the uh, the FM2N specifically. I, my first Nikon was an FM, so I like that form factor. And the FM2N was just the perfect uh, combination of a brighter view screen. Uh, higher shutter speeds, just great, great low light capability. So and I guess I got into Nikon because I actually started on Pentax, and Pentax, I, I I love the quality of the the came out lenses, and I just fell in love with uh, vintage cameras through Pentax. But I didn't find once I started doing paid work, I just didn't find like you know the whole stop down metering thing being fast enough for me to use, and like dimmer viewfinders and smaller lens selection. So the um, I I picked up an FM. Uh, an FM sort of by chance, and it was a Nikon guy after that. <laughs> yeah, you haven't been tempted on getting up to the, F the FM3A? You know, I, I just don't have a use for it because I don't shoot with any automation. I, I keep looking at the FM3A because I like new cameras. I, I, I like old cameras. Like, I love my 1930 Leica. When I'm, like, shooting a wedding for 12 hours, I, I don't want to rely on something that's 100 years old all the time. <laughs> so I, 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 do, I do like a new... And I also like to support newer equipment. Like, I like, I like, I like the idea of being able... like. One of the reasons I love like is you, not that I can afford to, but I could walk into Dan's right now and buy a brand new one, right? And it, it would be just like what, you know, I was shooting with 20 years. So I, I love that concept. About the FM2, in my opinion, I've looked at the FM3A also, and I've been on the fence. Hong Lee had one at one of the Chicago shows, and I played with it. And it's a fantastic camera. It's great. However, it's quite a bit more in terms of money of a step up from the FM2. And just in my mind, it's not worth the significant jump in price for what you get, you know, especially if AE isn't something you need. Take away the AE, the FM2 is not only is a less expensive camera, although the prices on that have gone up too. But that to me, that that is like the sweet spot Nikon for me. I agree. The F3 is a great camera. I don't use mine too often. I love the F2s quite a bit. I think the F2 is a more usable camera over the original F but it's big, it's heavy. Uh, the FM2 is just that right balance of the smaller body. It has everything I need. Uh, the titanium one, one to 4,000th top shutter speed, uh, a great display. You can change the view, the viewing screens. 
and it's got the the LEDs like like you talked about. So super reliable. And they made them up until I think Robert. When did they stop making the FM two? Like two thousand something like that. He's nodding yes, but he's on mute. But yeah, they made the FM two for almost twenty years. Yeah, Johnny, this is Anthony here. Hey, Anthony. I'm. Also a massive FM2 in fan. As a matter of fact, when I was a, a freshman in uh, Indiana University in my first photography class, it was the, the winter of, of 1982. And I think I probably got one of the first FM2 ends sold by B&H. Oh, nice. And that camera has been with me ever since. I mean, I still shoot that camera quite a bit. I've shot more frames on that FM2 in, than any camera that I've owned. But the question I have for you is it couldn't be more chalk and cheese with your, 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 your Leica M6 TTL. So I'm wondering, do you, if, if you still use the FM2 and does it like enter into your workflow for your, your, your wedding photography, or is it just more of a, like a personal travel uh, all around camera for you? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, I know what you're saying. There's definitely, uh, some, uh, big differences, uh, obviously just an SLR to rangefinder, but. I think the feature set, you know, it's just the 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 basic feature set and good ergonomics and a, and a small small body. One of the things I do with the FM uh, my FM two ends is I have FM three A uh, view screens in them. The brighter I think they're K three I think is the designation. So I'm just all about having that super bright viewfinder that I can see in in low light on the SLRs. You know, having like the faster lens is obviously important to 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 brighten up the the viewfinder too. But I I just love Nikon for some of the same reasons I love Leica. I love that you know they continued making all manual cameras for as long as they did. Nikon obviously you know they they handed things over to uh, Cosina for a bit and pulled out of the 35 millimeter SLR market. They helped, They were like one of the last holdouts, and I, I love that. You know, a few years ago, uh, I don't remember how long ago it was, but if in recent times, I I was able to purchase a brand new uh, 55 uh, 28 micro Nikkor, which any wedding photographer, you know, you need you need a, a, a macro lens. So I was able to buy that brand new, you know, and I just think that's really cool to be able to buy brand new equipment that's styled after this like 1960s, 1970s kind of like ethos. I, I guess, yeah, I think, you know, for, for weddings, you're you're shooting every genre, genre of photography, people like to say, you know, it, it's candid, it's, it's posed, it's, it's food, it's architecture, you know. And so, yeah, I, I definitely like to use both my SLRs and my rangefinders for like a, a longer, more elaborate uh, day, like a 12 hour day where I'm shooting bride from the time that they sip their first, I, I say from the first sip of coffee to the last sip of champagne at the end of the night, you know, I, it's good to have uh, both those systems, but sometimes I just pack it light, like on a smaller sheet, I'll choose one or the other uh, based on various things. Sometimes, honestly, it's just, you know, how I'm feeling <laughs> as if I'm going to shoot uh, SLR or rangefinder. I'm always interested about this increase in interest in film, you know, how it's making a comeback, you know, everybody's buying film, everybody's shooting film. But my, my question for you is like demand, you know, your wife shoots digital, you shoot film. Do you go along with her on every shot or like what, how often are you guys together working on a, on a wedding versus where it's only digital? Because I have to imagine some people just don't care. They just want pictures. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. I, I get variations of this question frequently. So it, it's interesting. Like when we first started working together, she had a little bit more interest in film. And so we were kind of like, I, 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 I had done, I had been shooting before I met her. And so I had done the whole, like I would show up. I, I remember one of my first bigger shoots, I was photographing Bill Clinton for a retirement company's magazine. I shot on my FM and I shot on like a D, I don't know, whatever was out then, like a D90 or something ridiculous like that. So I was always shooting everything like hybrid, like I was shooting film and digital. And, and my, my goal was, and I, and I was also working for a wedding studio at the time. So we were doing all the candids on uh, digital and the formal stuff on like hustle plots. So I had always been working in this hybrid environment and I was like, why am I shooting on these cameras and the style that I don't really like have as much of an affinity for? I know, you know, obviously you have to make deadlines and that kind of thing, especially when you're doing uh, like new stuff. So I just, my, my whole like thrust of things was to move towards film. So when I met my wife, she appreciated that and she's really helped me, you know, continue to do that. Right. But anyway, as far as demand goes, yeah, a lot of our clients don't 
give a damn if I'm shooting <laughs> on film or not. But they, I guess they must like the photos. So that that's that's like the main thing. Now, some people, they'll try to haggle us on price. And, you know, they think like, well, if we don't bring the digital or if we don't bring the film on, you know, we save some money or something like that. We do, we usually like to shoot together just because we enjoy that. But um, we do shoot separately sometimes too. And it's interesting. She gets all the, like she's doing athletic photography right now lately too. So she gets that stuff and the family portraits solo, but I get the uh, weddings solo. She doesn't really, people don't really hire her as much for uh, digital wedding stuff, but they do hire me solo for, for film, which actually is what Mark did. So, you know, I think there is a market. There are people that an appreciation for black and white and for film, and they, and they want that aesthetic. In fact, I see a lot of wedding photographers now. It's kind of pissing me off, frankly. <laughs> they're, these di- they're prominently digital folks, and they're offering film photography as part of their package, but they're only shooting, like, a couple of rolls. They're not really prepared. They come in with these, like, you know, Canon AE1s that have never been serviced. They only have, like, one of them. They, they, they tell you, like, well, we're only going to shoot three rolls of film, and, you know, it's not really a film centric photographer, but it's kind of become the value added option, right? Exactly. See, I'm a terrible business person, but you know the term. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like so to your point, like film is becoming more popular and it's it's uh, people are aware and it's in their minds and so they're they are looking for it so much so that these digital photographers are jumping on the bandwagon right so i, I think it's kind of funny like actually I've, I've got a question about uh i'm an old film shooter from way back like everybody do clients what in the mind of the average guy or woman who's not into photography what do they perceive as the difference between film and digital i mean what what, what do you find people expect when you shoot film and when <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's 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 always amusing too. When I when I started shooting over twenty years ago, for a long time I was shooting color, and so and especially when I teamed up with my wife, people couldn't really tell the difference between our shots. Uh, there there were a lot of reasons why I moved to black and white, but one of them was just so that I could f- like sort of kind of distinguish myself a little bit more, not only from my from my wife's work but also just from digital in general. Like one of the things that's always been important to me, I shoot with a lot of high speed grainy film. I like to emphasize my grain in my shots. Like I, I kind of want to let people know, hey, this this is something different. This isn't what you're seeing, you know, in magazines and stuff, traditional realms. But anyway, my point is, is yeah, some people don't know the difference or can't see the difference. You know, they just like good photos and, and that's fine too. But I, I do get some strange reactions. You know, I, I still get people like trying to look at the back of my camera for, you know, <laughs> shot, you know, it's always fun. Or people, you know, especially the people like if I showed up at a wedding, obviously the only people that I've interacted with are maybe the immediate family, but usually just the bride and groom in a lot of cases. So I show up there and I'm shooting film. I'm like working these cameras and, you know, by hand and everything. And, you know, I, I get some looks from like the people that haven't, you know, the people that used to shoot film and they're like, hey, I haven't seen somebody doing that for a long time. Doesn't that slow you down, though? Do you get people wanting to talk like us, though? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, especially, you know, it's funny because after the, the M6, the new M6 was announced, I actually, people, before I was like, people would be like, oh yeah, I used to, I used to have uh, a, a Canon AE1 in high school. I used to shoot, you know, and, uh, but now I was like, I get these people coming up to me and they're like, hey, is that a Leica M6? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it is actually. Like, so it's, it's pretty cool, like how um, people are becoming aware of film photography yeah. and, and, and Leica and, you know, just it, it's cool. Like it's I, I don't have to keep for a while there it was touch and go. I felt like I had to explain myself, like, what is this guy doing? So, Dan, Dan, are you seeing that here in Chicago a lot too? people wanting their wedding shot on film and coming to you or, or local photographers and asking them if they do something like he does? Uh, not, not specifically, but we have seen a huge uptick in just shooting film and, and the sales of film cameras. I know that there's a lot of interest in it. I really don't do any kind of professional shooting, although I do hear some pros grousing about it. Well, people wanting to talk cameras and kind of getting in their way, but also just about this new quote, I'm using air quotes here, this new film thing that's happening. And I, I do, you know, I do think that 
Leica has done a terrific job in raising awareness of their brand, increasing the younger set of uh, either photographers or, or aspiring photographers or people who in one way or another are aspiring to e either photography or the brand. And, you know, I, I, what I tell people at the sales counter is like, you know, they're nervous about carrying a Leica maybe. And I say, you know what? 85% of the people you're going to meet have no idea what that camera is. And they're going to look at you and they're going to say, oh, look at that guy using an old, cheap, old, ratty camera, right? The other 15% are going to come up to you foaming at the mouth and ask you what, which model, what lens. And, you know, because I, and I'm one of those people, you know, the, the Leica fans, but most people don't really know what they are. But increasingly, we're seeing people recognize the brand and wanting film wanting to get into film even though they began with digital to begin with and i'll tell you i never shot a wedding commercially in my life but as a person who's attended weddings i would take my my m3 with me just to take personal photos and it's usually the other photographers the professional photographers that are freaked out that i'm there with a leica oh yeah it, it makes them more nervous than you know the bride and groom would ever be seeing a film camera there yeah they're like oh who's this guy who's this guy yeah <laughs> So, so, so J Johnny, I'll just say that I wish that I'd, I'd met you 28 years ago because when I got married you know, as a photographer at the time, I was adamant in meeting with the photographer that he was going to shoot a significant amount of, of Tri-X at my wedding. Oh, uh, yeah. Tri-X is one of my go-tos. Because I, want, I wanted the look. I wanted the grain. I wanted the shadow. And it wasn't until like a month after the wedding that I realized that he completely blew me off, acted like I didn't know what I was doing, shot the whole thing in Portra. And when I confronted <laughs> him about it, he's like, I can just fix it in Photoshop. I'll just desaturate it if you really want oh black and white. Uh, and I was like, it's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still angry about that. That's frustrating. Yeah, I yeah I, I I hope that the uh the weddings I shoot for other photographers uh you know they're happy with the results. I just la this and last year I've got a few of those guys and the the last one I did his his wedding got rained out it, it got moved inside and so I think you know maybe his his wife was expecting these big bright photos but I was at you know Triex at like sixteen hundred and T Max thirty two hundred at sixty four hundred and like this kind of stuff and so they're they're much much moodier. I, I think they're great photos, but I always wonder, you know, because you, you get you get feedback from people. Johnny, if if we could find somebody like a photographer who knows what you do and has had you shoot one of their weddings, maybe they could come on the show and tell us what they thought of the pictures. Oh, that'd be neat. Mark, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, that was kind of the whole point, though, is that I mean, having that sort of different look from the standard wedding shots. And also as somebody that shoots quite a bit and loves the grain, I was all about that. And I was thrilled to see the results that, that we got back. And it was also just fun. I got, I got to handle the camera briefly during the uh, one portion of the <laughs> it was like shortly, uh, was, this, was it the pre we were having the, oh, having uh, all the yeah, yeah. Like cocktail hour, I guess. Yeah. Or yeah. Inside. Yeah. I think I, I think I passed you an M6 at that point. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's, it, I fully knew that's what the look that, that I wanted to go for uh with with the shots and and they came out better than i could have hoped oh that's great thanks it's style i mean it comes down to the style of, of what you what you are comfortable with what the client wants what what you're comfortable in providing and uh you know you have a very unique style and it's not a style that you can get by shooting digital and using nick to convert to black and white it, it just isn't the same and and it works for you, so that that's the important part. And and you know your your clients are gonna your clients are your best advertisers because they're gonna be happy with the work and it's gonna bring more work. It's different from from a guy who like you said you work for a wedding studio. You know that's that's different. That's assembly line type process. Yeah, it sure was. And and everybody the work if if it's a if it's a good studio, every shooter shoots the same way. That the other shooters shoot, so it's consistent. Yeah, that's probably why I don't work anymore. Yeah, exactly. So your your style is your own. Yeah, no, that 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 that's a great point. I I wouldn't trade. I I worked uh, for like a you know a wedding studio. We were shooting four or five weddings a weekend in you know the spring through fall. You know, it was just uh, it was exhausting. It was uh, relentless, and uh, it really kicked my ass. And but I learned a ton from it i i still uh keep up with uh my uh you know my, my old boss there and he i learned so much from him and from just working that business but i you know i was always on that mission to like 
do you know find find my voice and my voice is pretty pretty narrow and pretty specific but the yeah i, I like to think that the people that you know that I, i'm giving something to people that uh it's hard to find elsewhere so i, I hope everybody that's looking for me finds me that's <laughs> that's all <laughs> It's actually uh, interesting you mentioned the studio production type line. When I got married, and I'm coming up to 25 years now, and I had to try and organize my wedding in a different state and city. So it was it was a bit of an ordeal. But the photographer that we sort of met, he you know, he, he came in with his RB67, and uh, which was the, the standard kit at the point, and, and an SLR. And, and of course, you know, I said to him, him up front, I said, yeah, I, I hope you brought enough film because I'm not going to, you know, I, I've got a few ideas of what I want photographed and that. I don't think he quite understood the context of it because I was doing photography already that, you know, I would actually have quite a few ideas that we needed yeah. to do. And, and we get towards the end and he's run out of film. What? <laughs> yeah, this, 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 this isn't good here. And he actually scram had to scramble to a Seven Eleven and get a whole bunch of I think it was Superior or something <laughs> like that. So the so a portion of my wedding was actually shot on Seven Eleven Superior stored film, nice, you know, nice. which which God knows what you know what that could have turned out with. But well, luckily, it turned out all right. And uh, <laughs> and I, and I suspect if I hadn't actually sat there and said, "Yeah, I want these kind of shots," it would have been the production line type stuff, and I, I would have actually been quite unhappy. Well, it- in the U.S., Ray, Ray knows about this because he's he's been through it, too. In the U.S., wedding photographers are the biggest copycats in the world. <laughs> I mean, if, if you're a successful wedding photographer, you can start doing seminars for other wedding photographers to teach them what you do and make more money doing it than you can shooting weddings. Yeah, and selling the uh, the presets and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, it's not just that, but, you know, uh, the st- uh, flash diffusers, uh, yeah. brackets. Gary Fong. Yeah, Gary Fong type stuff. Yeah, rock, rock. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. I think that, I think like Instagram and Etsy in some ways helps the types of wedding photographers that just want to shoot cookie cutter images because there's like an unlimited catalog for young brides to look at what kinds of shots, you know, the ring picture, you know, weird, funny, smashing faces and cake pictures, you know, those, those typical shots, you just got to check off the list. And I think that... uh, if if your aim is to just make as much money as possible and just churn out a product, you just go on Instagram and show a bunch of the generic wedding pictures that probably 80% of brides are, that's what I want on my wedding too, right? I mean, I think that in order to truly differentiate yourself from just another generic photographer, uh, is it, it takes work. And I mean, that's kind of like what you're doing, Johnny. You you wanted the grain, you wanted images that didn't look like your wife's, you know? I'm, I'm sure the first time you heard somebody tell you they couldn't differentiate your work from hers was probably very deflating to hear yeah i mean we it's funny the first couple of years that we were working together we definitely had some uh back and forth <laughs> about uh you know because she would she was shooting digital and she'd convert things to black and white and i was like oh you can't do that like you know and you know and i'm shooting in color and people are like oh well, you know which one of you took this one you know and it, we both had some identity struggles with that i think ironed them out <laughs> for the most part <laughs> But, but, you know, I, I want to, I do want to say though, one of the things, you know, back to, back to the studio I used to work for, Bradley Images in Baltimore, by the way, Brad Brad Zizzo, um, he taught me a lot. And one of the things that always impressed me with this guy, it was, I don't agree with it, but his philosophy was, I'm going to give people exactly what they want, no matter what they want. He, he, he had offered to shoot my wedding. I I reluctantly uh, had to decline. Uh, I had another guy, good friend of mine also, and shot his whole his whole thing is is i can i can do anything like i can shoot it uh, if you want me to shoot this on leica or hasselblad or you want me to shoot this on you know uh digital you want to make it warm you want to make it cool you want to what whatever you know you want a photojournalism style you want it uh like abstract or i you know you name it like this guy he he's he's a great chameleon i guess now i guess the thing that i i I got out of that when i was young is he's so talented and, and so technically very skilled proficient photographer but i i felt like uh, you know, for me, I wanted a, I, I, I wanted a vision. I was still putting my vision together at that time, but, but that was important to me is like having a signature. And I think survival of modern professional photographers in some ways relies on having that distinction. But, but, but there is a big business for people that, yeah, just all kind of do it the same way. But I, I, I don't, I, I get frustrated with that 
sort of style of photography and i i feel like people should be exploring their own voices and that kind of thing but it it is it's it's tough like when you're trying to make a living in photography not to do what the client wants you know like it it is it's frustrating for me the few times i've had uh clients and they didn't really understand what i did they just hired us because they you know somebody knew somebody and the price was right or you know something like that something uh, um, basic like that you know and and they got the photos and they didn't really understand what I was going for, you know, and it's, it's kind of heartbreaking, you know, to have to deal with that sort of, uh, you, you put, you put your, your best into that and, um, and it's not, it's not reciprocated. It's not appreciated. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I can see both sides of it. I'm, I'm on my side, but I, I understand the other side. So, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about your business. Is, does anybody else have any questions for, uh, for Johnny? Alan. Uh, well, I'm I'm here because in the last episode, I feel like I got caught in the crossfire between Gabe and uh, and Jeff uh, from the I Dream of Cameras. Who who are they? I'm not I'm not here to start it up again. <laughs> but Paul said, "How come you never write us?" And I thought, well, I ought to just show up and, and for a few minutes and. Uh, it's better than writing letters or writing emails. Well, Alan, I follow I follow you on Facebook and I enjoy your posts. So I'm glad you showed up. And uh, okay, well, thank thank you. Yeah, and and the thing with the thing with the uh, with Rick and Morty and the gang at I Dream of Cameras, they're good sports and they're they're good people and they do a good podcast. Oh, I I I, I know how, I know it was all in jet. Or I'm assuming it was all. In jest. It was it was all in jest, and it's it's been a lot of fun for everybody. I was I was excited to hear that Johnny was going to be here, and although you didn't specifically say it, that Dan was going to be here, because about, well, sometime just before COVID struck, I have a, a Leica 3F that I inherited from my father-in-law, and I, the lens was fogging up, and so I, cause I'm in the Chicago area, I brought it into Dan. And he he said, well, well, we can clean it up or we'll try to clean it up and we'll take a look at it and give it a CLA, which he did. And uh, it's working well. I unfortunately don't use it enough but because I think I'm a little afraid of, uh, of uh, taking the like out, as you were talking about earlier, Dan, you know, about people saying, oh, look at that camera. But uh, I, need, I do need to get it out and exercise it. And use it the same way I use my uh, my Olympus XA. So Dan, if I if I can change you know, directions for just a second, among the Camerosity podcast hosts, there's been this like pernicious virus that's moved through the other hosts, and it, it began with Theo and this like weird talk about, oh my God, is this a two cam lens or a three cam lens? And and then you know Mike's like oh this this r8 you know what you know i'm not sure about this form factor and then then paul moves in like a drug dealer and starts acquiring like massive lots of 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 like slr bodies so i'm just i'm curious as a person that is a a, a preeminent like a dealer what's your take on the like a slr market you know what what do you see as the the trends what are the ones that you like to, to sell what do you recommend you know what's your what's your overview I'd like to first say that I would like to think that I set some of that. And I had some hand in setting all of this Leica-itis in motion. Oh, yeah. I would like to think that I played some small part in it. But, I, you know, it's funny. I was just having a conversation similar to this with uh, about our cameras uh, with a client. And we really don't handle the R series very much anymore. We handle the lenses. Uh, because people like to use them on different cameras. They like to use them on the SL platform or other L mount uh, cameras or Sony's or whatever, Fuji's, whatever people are putting lenses on these days. And, and I think that's great. The problem that we're having and that we've been facing for years is that fewer and fewer technicians work on the R series cameras. So even though the market is very strong for them, I think, I mean, people are shooting film like there's no tomorrow. You know, like I said, this quote unquote new film thing, this fad that's happening. So it's kind of a shame that that a lot of these cameras have fallen by the wayside, mainly because there's no one repairing them. Now, there are people that I know that work on the Leicaflex and Leicaflex SL and SL2 models. And I think they're terrific. I mean, they're heavy. 
Uh, Mike's way, Mike's waving a Leica around right now. I see you there. So I think they're terrific. I mean, I learned uh, my, the first Leica I ever shot was an R3. And if you've seen my photographs, that's really not saying very much at all, but I, I, so I'm familiar with them and it's kind of a shame that there aren't technicians working on them because I feel like the market would be a little bit stronger. Uh, I'll tell you that even with this new film fad that we're all experiencing, the last time we got a call about an R camera was months ago. People just don't call about that stuff much anymore. But but then again, we also don't really have very much advertised on our website because we really just don't take it in much anymore. Yeah, they're all calling Paul. Right. <laughs> Dan, I don't know if you saw, I don't know if you saw, but I made an 800 mile round trip day to pick up a, a, a collection of SLRs. And uh, there were like seven bodies and I think there were 10 or 12 lenses. Every, in lenses, everything from 19 millimeter to, meter to a, a 400 F5. But the coolest two were a black paint SL Mott mm. and a black chrome SL2 Mott. Yeah, you don't see those every day. No, those are those are scarce. Those are rare. And so, and actually, Anthony, to your you know back to your question for a moment, I will say the collectible market's a little bit different. Like the 50 Yara or th- or models like Paul's talking about, like or the original Leica Flex in black paint. Or anytime you have full sets, uh, but Paul, I would just like to thank you for taking care of that collection because I I hate to say it, and I'm lucky to have to say it, but we turned down our a lot of our stuff. We it's just there's not not enough of a market for it, and believe me, I cannot stand to turn down any camera stuff, let alone like a stuff. But the market is, as I see it, is just kind of at least in my little corner, it's just kind of weak. And really, the service is the biggest problem. Yeah. Well, the big problem, too, is that the lenses got expensive because the Cine people yeah. started snapping up the lenses. They were paying top dollar for the yeah. lenses. Then they would send them and have them modified for Cine use. And uh, so you've got bodies with no lenses to put on them. That's what frustrates me so much, especially with the early R's, like the R3 and the R4. I mean, what are you selling an R4 body for, Paul? 150 bucks if it's in. Serial number over one million six hundred thousand. They'll go for one hundred and fifty dollars. So one hundred and fifty bucks for a Leica SLR. That in, in every stretch of the way is a good camera, but because you don't have a lens for it, it's just not worth anything. And you go on eBay and search for any Leica SLR, even the SLs, and they are ninety five percent body only, body only, because the lenses are just disappearing into the cine market, like you said. So while it's great that people love those lenses and they're finding new homes, I think, in my opinion, Dan, that's it, in addition to lack of people being able to repair them, I think that the lens is disappearing from the SLRs is another reason people don't shoot the SLRs. Is I think you're right. I think you're right, Mike. And I'll, I'll tell you for any any uh, of your listeners, w- I've got boxes of, of our lenses. We just don't bring them to market because they're going to wind up on eBay. We don't bring them to market in our store because we can't sell them clean. And so we have a lot of that stuff. We sell it as is. But 50 Summicrons, Leica Flexes, I got a box of R3s. I mean, God bless. If you could sell them, it's great. We just, we, we have a really hard time with that. But it's great gear. A 3 cam 50 millimeter F2 Summicron is a, a, in good condition is a five to $600 lens. Agreed. And people will buy them and put them on Sony's or Nikon's or any mirrorless camera. It'll bolt right onto it. Sure. Uh, in fact, it'll bolt onto the Nikon DSLRs just with a Litex adapter. So it's easy to change the mounts. And that's the way to go, if you ask me. I mean, I think the, you know, optics make the image, you know. This is what I tell people at our sales counter all the time and over the phone and over email. You know, if you you take a Leica lens and you put it on a shoebox and you get a Leica image. If you take a, you know, a, a POS lens and you put it on a, a you know, $100,000 Leica, you still get a POS image, you know, from an optical standpoint. So I, I, I think it it optics make the image and if it were me and on a on any kind of budget i would go for the lens first and the camera second i mean presuming that you don't have any other constraints like you need a certain type of sensor or certain other constraints it's interesting you should say that i i had uh, oddly enough i you you know i told i mentioned this earlier you you are, have led to my downfall because you <laughs> said that the m10m was one of your favorite cameras the, the monochrome m10 or maybe it was an m9 monochrome so I, of course, had to have one. And so when I got it, I, re- I liked it so much that I realized I really wanted to shoot color also. So that led to an M10R. Yeah, you know, I had that problem too. And I, I think 
It's a good problem to have. I'm not complaining, but I, I, you know what? I haven't picked up that M10R in months and I use the monochrome all the time. I don't even know why I have it. Paul, you shoot colors. So like I, I would, I mean, I think the M10R might prove to be the last great digital Leica that they, that they. I think you're right. Uh, that, and what, what was fun was I happened to have an eight element Summicron that was made for the, for the uh, M3. So it had goggles. And I also had a light lens lab, eight element Summicron, which is the, the je- Chinese version of, of the uh, Leica lens. I, I tested them. Uh, side by side and tripoded, you know, brick wall and real life scenarios. There was absolutely no difference in them. I, I mean, I could not see a difference between the two, and uh, that surprised me. I think that the the modern coatings and modern lens making is just it's easier to replicate that now. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are. I'm sure that there are people who say, you know, oh, it's it's not quite the same, or I mean, anything can look like anything. I mean, I, I strive personally to have my photographs be correct when they come out of the camera. And so I really like, and I'm not on a high horse about it. I mean, I flub plenty of photographs, don't get me wrong, but I use a lens uh, because I like the flavor of the lens. You know, and I've had people come up to me and go, oh, man, Mr. Big Leica man using that uh, crummy old lens. Well, yeah, this is what I like, you know. So and again, it's not about right or wrong. It's, what, it's about what's right for you, you know, or for me. And so and, and I think that that if people appreciated the other lenses like our lenses and vintage lenses more that they would realize that you can really get some very beautiful photographs. I mean, a 35 LMAR, 35 millimeter F3.5 lens from the 1940s, tack sharp if you're shooting it out, you know, outside, not in really, you know, harrowing conditions. It's a tack sharp lens, terrific lens. And, and the Sumars, even the 50 Sumar, which is, you know, a cheap ass lens. That's right. It's red mount. That's right. Even wide open, they have a, a you know, it, this is going to sound stupid, but they have that like a glow yeah. that, that you don't see with with a sumacron at f2 they have the gl- do they have the glow even when the front element isn't scratched to hell did somebody say sumar <laughs> well you know that we won't talk about that that's a do-it-yourself soft focus kit <laughs> yeah well you know it's it's, you're, it's easier to use a sumar than it is to smear vaseline on your front element <laughs> It's sharp in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard people describe that as the the Sumar in particular as a, a soft sharp look. So it's got a softness to it, but it's in focus and it's it's it just doesn't have that crispness of like a like a Sumar on it. Well, it's it's just amazing that this is 1935. Uh, some guy using a slide rule. Uh, it's absolutely amazing yeah. what they were able to do. Just remember, they're all unique too. Every everyone is unique. Oh, they are. I mean, you there's no consistency among them. I mean, it's it's like. Uh, <laughs> you know, you got one guy, two guys sitting next to each other making the same lens. You couldn't tell they were even the same lens. But once you stop them down to F5, 6, or 8. Paul, as our, as our resident, uh, like a SLR pusher, where do you recommend that people start? If somebody's interested in checking one out, is it the SL2 that is the, the sweet spot? Is it the R4? What what? Where where would you guide somebody who, who wants to dip their toe into the uh, Leica SLR world? Well, I would go to an SL. By, by for cert for sure. And the reason is that it's, you know, a lot of smart guys say that the Leica SL2 might be the most perfect SLR film camera ever made. And and I won't go into, you know, I don't, I don't know their justification for that, but the, the, it, it really is a good camera. The only problem with it is, that it, like a lot of things, it has not aged well in certain aspects. And the delamination and the silvering of the prism uh, is something you really got to look at on SLs or SL2s because the silvering does go away on them. And, and uh, usually they're usable. You'll just see some brown, tiny brown spots uh, in the finder. And it's annoying, but it, it doesn't really keep you from using I could maybe, since I'm kind of new, really, to the Leica SLRs, Anthony, Paul loaned me the R8, which I sent back. Uh, he just sent me this SL2 black. I've previously shot in an original Leica Flex, the original 1966 model, and I have an R4. So by no means have I shot them all, right? But I can already tell you some generalizations. And how I would answer your question, Anthony, about where to get started is, as always, it depends on what you're looking for. In my opinion, if you think of Leica as a rangefinder company, you love the, the screw mounts, you love the M series, you know, even through the M8 or M7, I mean, the film ones I'm saying, uh, and you want that metal German, if it takes six parts to do something, they're going to use 12, you know, that ethos. 
that is so prevalent in the M series, you got to do the SLs. The SL is a huge improvement over the original Leica Flex, and the SL2 is a, is a marginal improvement over the SL. And I, you know, I was flashing this in front of the camera earlier, but this SL2, I've had this thing for five hours and I'm already in love with it. I had Paul's R8 for three weeks. And I, I had to force myself to finish the role. I felt the camera was too chunky. It looks cool. Very cool looking camera. Made excellent images, right? The pictures were outstanding. Few finder bright. I could not get over the chunky, thick body. Something Johnny said earlier about muscle memory. Even though I've never before five hours ago, have never held one of these cameras. I don't need to look at it and I can feel the controls. I know where the shutter speed dial is. I know where the wind lever is. I know how to instinctively grip the focusing ring, right? I've never handled this camera before. The ergonomics are already familiar with me. If I were to shoot this SL2, muscle memory would be in effect. When I had that M8, I'm sorry, the R8, the shutter speed dial or the program auto exposure dials on the left, uh, I, I found that the the grip for the, I had the zoom lens on it. I, I It just did not feel right to me. I felt like I was holding an alien camera. It didn't speak to me. I didn't like it. Now, I think Theo, you have an, an R8, right? Yeah, I do. I actually went through a slightly different uh, process. I, I started off with an R3, which had a problem. And on Paul's recommendation, I got the R4. Now, this R4 had, had an issue and I had to send it back, but it wasn't with the actual shooting. It was actually, it was an ancillary problem, but I didn't want to sort of pay for a car, uh, camera, which with an issue. But I loved shooting with it. I then got another R4 and it had exposure issues. So that, that sort of went back. But again, I loved shooting both of them. And I thought, well, two R4s, add them together, you get an R8. So I went and bought an R8. I'm sure there's logic there that <laughs> somewhere, but anyway. And I must admit, the R8 is probably my favorite SLR to shoot now. And I'm a Nikon shooter. So it, it really sort of spoke to me. Now, having said that, I love shooting with the R4. It is, it is a great experience and it is a great camera, especially because it's smaller and it's a little bit more traditional. Yeah. But the R8, if I want something top quality, recent. It just sort of, I, I think they designed it really well because they just break the mold and, and design something that was totally new. Yeah. Yeah. I found that it's easy to use. It's, it's, um, it's viewfinder is just magic. I mean, that, yeah. that's the one thing that really got me. It's, it's magic. It's got a lot of lights down the bottom and uh, with, you know, the LCD and so on, but it's, but it's not invasive in, in, in the actual picture that you're trying to take. Yeah. I mean, I, everything you said, I agree with. I, it just didn't speak to me. I it felt like an alien camera in my hand. Whereas the SL2, again, back to what I said, that it depends on what you're looking for. If you think of, of Leica as a rangefinder company, you have an M3 or an M4 or something. You're thinking, Hey, I wonder what their SLRs are like. I would say go with the SL or the SL2. I feel like it's an, even though they're two very different style cameras, you know, SLR versus rangefinder. I'm not going to get into that. But I feel like that's an easier transition than jumping from like an M3 to an R8 would be. If you don't have the money for the R8 or just don't like the appeal or the, the size of it, because it is big, the R4 is is a great camera. You know, that's based off of the Minolta XD11. There is a, a bit of a Japanese layout to this. You know, it's a, it, it relies a little bit more on electronics. It's still a very heavy camera. It looks great. I mean, the, the R4 is a very attractive camera too. Bright, you know, red uh, Leica logo on it. A little bit more modern, you know, but it doesn't feel like a mechanical rangefinder anymore. So if if you want to be able to shoot Leica and with Leica lenses, Leica quality, go with an R, you know, and then just you can determine whether you want the R3 through the R8, depending on which features are more important to you. If you want something that looks unlike anything else, you got to get the R8. But for a more traditional camera, I'd go with the R4, but if you're a Leica purist and want to make that transition from the rangefinder market to SLRs, my vote would be the SL or the SL2. Well, in the in the pile of Leica flexes I got was one, besides that R4 that Mike has now, I got one R7, uh, which was the final camera until they went to the, the uh, guppy body shape on the R8. And and I'm really I was really impressed with it. It's actually a very nice camera. It handles well. The metering modes on it are interesting. Yeah, uh, I I wasn't dissatisfied with that camera at all. Yeah, Paul, I was going to ask you: Were there are there any turkeys or any dead ends that you should avoid if you're looking at these bodies? Because you never really hear about the five, the six, and the seven. You know, hear a lot about the fours. You know what happened when when they had the R four. The problem with the R4 was they did have some circuit board problems in them, and, and they, they made too many different models. They had an R4, there's an R4S, 
And then there was an R4SP. And then suddenly there's an R5, there's an R6, there's an R6.2. And, you know, then the R7, it, it just, they change models too often. And there were, there were very minor differences between a lot of them. An R4 is a good camera. It's good to stay right around serial number above 1,600,000. That's the improved circuit board. I'm sending this back. Yours is 152. Yeah. Oh. 154. So it's it's you're. I think you're okay. I I think you're. They they just say one six because that's easier to say. So I've I've got a question for you. Uh, uh, like a SLR experts, you, you mentioned Minolta, and I know Minolta made those. Did Minolta ship those off to Leica, and Leica would calibrate them and okay them? Did they have Leica people at the factory in Japan? How did that unfold? No, they were made in Germany or Portugal. Oh, they were made in Germany. The the R R camera. I didn't know that. Yeah, the R's were made in Portugal or Germany. It depends on which model. Oh, I I didn't know that. Okay. Paul, Paul, we had some. Wasn't there a model made in Midland as well in Ontario? An R. Yes. Wow. I think so. Yes, there was. There was. Yeah, a, I think so. Was. Yeah, there was one model, and I don't remember what it was, but yeah, they did make one body. Uh, maybe an R four SP or one of the one of those models. I I think that's correct. I'll tell you a couple of things to look at. I wanted Paul to answer the question at first because he's got all the inventory. I don't really have anything. But Anthony, I'll tell you what I think about the R cameras. I agree with everything that you guys said. I find the M8, uh, pardon me, the R8 and R9 kind of ungainly. I think that if you've got a good strong back or you haven't been to the gym uh, lately, you could get an, a Leica Flex or a Leica Flex SL. I mean, they're heavier cameras, but there's something about that, the metal and that mirror slapping. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've taken a picture and what Paul is saying about the viewfinder is very true, but they're, they're very basic and very steady cameras. And they're much easier to repair than any of the later cameras. Uh, the R3 is, is a good camera in particular for pounding nails. The R4 is good, especially above 1 million six. The R4S and the R4SP make terrific door stops. What changed at 1 million six? Like, what's the difference? They're, they're on circuit, they're on circuit boards. They had circuit board problems. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, circuit boards. It, yeah, it was circuit boards. And then the R5, the R6, and the R7 are all the same form factor, and they're terrific cameras with little kind of variations in the metering. And Paul actually probably knows a little bit more about this than I do. Uh, but I'll tell you what the real, the crown jewel of the R system was, is the R6.2, because it's fully mechanical, and it has a meter. Now, the R, I, my recollection is that the R5, six and the r7 are also fully mechanical in other words if you take the batteries out the shutter still fires the problem with the r6.2 was it was a seiko shutter and when seiko stopped making those shutters they nobody will work on them anymore oh see there you go you learn something new every day that's the problem and i agree everybody that has ever owned an r6.2 that works loves it and and it's a mechanic it's a manual camera yeah I and mean, it's a manual mechanical camera but the shutter, you know, the fact that it's going to be really difficult if anything goes wrong has uh, has created some issues with that particular one. Oh, that's interesting. I never knew that. I I've always thought them to be the the most reliable of all. And in all in my all my years so far, I I've only seen a few of them not you know not working, needing repair, and going out for parts. It's like everything. It's like everything. You know, it's today. There are things that are going to fail over time. Yeah. It's not, you know, they, they, I don't know that they ever repaired any of them under warranty because it probably none of them broke. You know, and the Seiko shutters were very reliable. Right. The 6.2, isn't that commanding a premium also because Sebastio Salgado is famous for using one of those? I, I, I don't really have my finger on that pulse. I, I, I don't, that's possible. It's very possible. Uh, I think, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, sometimes people see, you know, Brad Pitt or Kim Kardashian with a Leica and that, or it's on the cover of Harrington's or whatever. And it, it, you know, the market goes bonkers. Yeah. Dan, the camera city podcast is well on its way to being influencers ourselves. So if you find yourself with a surplus of something, just let us know and we'll hype it up for a little bit and help you sell them. Oh, that would be wonderful. You are influencers. You influence me constantly. Listen, I, I, here's what we got. I've got boxes of R3s and 
<laughs> I've got and Leica flexes, Leica flexes, and I've got all this stuff for anybody who wants to start a camera repair business or who is who might be interested in shooting a camera that has a meter but the meter doesn't work. You know, stuff like that. We got tons of it. So, well, you know, Dan, yellow, sorry, Yellow Springs isn't that far from Chicago. That's right. I can come up and take a truckload. Well, the, the <laughs> thing about the the uh, the R three was. You know, and there there was a, a time when you had the the joint venture between Minolta and Leica, and and it was they were they were pretty pretty friendly, and uh, so that happened with the with the CL, the Minolta Leica CL, uh, and a couple lenses that were there. Then you had the R3, which was an XE7, and then you had the X the R4, which was an XD11. But the other thing they did was they did some lenses. Leica or Minolta actually made. Two prime lenses for the uh, Leica R mount. An R mount. Yep, that's correct. The 16 millimeter and the 500 millimeter, both of which are Minolta made lenses made in Japan and several zooms. I, I think, and, and I may be wrong about this, but I think Leica actually only made one zoom lens. It was a 28 to 70 millimeter 3.5 ref 4. What was the what was the zoom on the R8 you loaned? Me? That was a 35 to 70 f 4 or 3.5. Okay. That was a Minolta made lens. But I have the 16 that I picked up in this last uh, go around, and it looks just like a Rocor. I mean, it has the Minolta, it was the same, uh, same shape. Dan, if you're real serious about getting rid of that stuff, maybe we'll have the Camerosity outlet at Tamarkin uh, camera. We'll have to set that up. I would love that. You know, yeah, that would be great, actually. Maybe, maybe sometime this summer we can do uh, a meetup in Chicago if you guys like. Yeah. We can, uh, we have every July. Uh, at Tamarkin Camera, we have Leica Palooza, and there's usually a camera show called Danny T's Bargain Basement that occurs in tandem, and so we should make it a joint venture. Well, we'll get Anthony. We'll be uh, completely healed by then. He'll be able to travel. We'll get Theo to go on a business trip to Chicago. So um, we'll get the... We, Paul and I already have shirts. Theo and Anthony have shirts, too. Maybe by then we'll have some swag. I forgot to say at the Cincinnati show, there were these two ladies that showed up, li literally thought we were selling t-shirts because I think we had said Paul and I are going to be there with our t-shirts, not realizing like we'd be wearing our t-shirts, but these, <laughs> this lady's like, I want to buy a Camerosity t-shirt. And she was so disappointed that we weren't actually selling them. I didn't know that, Mike. I would have sold mine. Oh, really? Even if they taken it right off. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time, right? <laughs> no, I, I've, I've undressed at plenty of camera shows. <laughs> <laughs> Good segue. Let's transition back to Johnny. There was an article that appeared today that you wrote uh, about some new spools. You're not making the spools. You just kind of partner with these guys that maybe weren't doing a good enough job at promoting themselves, and and you really like the product. So you want to tell us a little more about that? Uh, yeah. So this uh, company, a small startup in Germany. Actually, I, I've never said their name out loud. I'm sure I'd butcher it. But go to Petapixel's website today, and my, my article's there, quick, quick load spools for like a Barnex prior to the uh, prior to the 3G this, this uh, spool fits in. And it's a product that I was actually looking for. I was trying to figure out a way because like back to what we were talking about earlier about shooting uh, weddings uh, with Barnex or, you know, my professional gigs with Barnex. I'd like to do more of that. One of the things that holds me back is just having to reload. I, I'm not one of these people that complains about loading Barnex. Yeah, I get why you know there's some extra steps to it, given that the camera was built in the 19 or designed in the 1930s, 1920s. One thing that holds me back is just loading. So I, for a while, I've been looking for a solution to faster loading because I'm like, why can we do it in the M cameras, but we couldn't do it in the Barnett cameras? So someone came up with this. These guys are selling 3D printed uh, take up spools. You drop your film in like an M. Basically, it turns the Barnack into an M without a film door. So you, you drop your film in and you don't have to trim your leader and you don't have to take out the spool. You just drop your film in like an M. It takes some getting used to to do that without the door. For, I, I think if you know, you're know you used to using the door, some people don't use the door. So they're probably right at home. It's a little bit of a contentious topic because Leica, Barnack Leica shooters love to you know tell people that you have to trim the leader, you have to trim the leader. But this is... The, as as you can see from the reel that Mike's holding up, it has the tulip three tulip design that the uh, the M4 has. I'll try I'll try to to explain it because it's it's difficult, but um, it does look like a tulip. So you have like a center shaft, and it has the bumps on it for the sprockets, and then there's three like outer pieces that kind of flare outward, and they have the bumps on them. So you have the 
the sprocket holes on both the inside and the outside. And I mean, I obviously don't have a camera here, but I explained the first time you sent me one of these, I played with it outside the camera just so I could get a feel for what I'm doing, which I think anybody would have to do to kind of get how this thing works. But you slide it in the camera through the through the bottom and you push it in all the way. And they're designed to just be left there. Like, you, I mean, you could keep taking it back out, but they fit quite tightly. I think, Johnny, you said you had to use tweezers to pull yours out. Yeah, yeah. But but I would say if you sh- have multiple cameras you want to use these in, you would just get multiple spools and just leave them in there. And, and I'm going to show you guys this. But essentially, if you could pretend this thing is in the camera, you just drop the film on the inside. And it's not going to do it here because I'm doing it. Like that. Okay, so I just slid it behind one of the tulips like this. And then as you twist it, it starts to it starts to wrap itself around. And the tulips are what hold the leader. So I mean if you could imagine this being inside the camera, I mean I'm pulling on this pretty hard. I mean I don't want to rip it, but it's not coming undone. And I think the flaw with using the, the traditional spool is you're sticking this tiny little leader into the little slot. And it's very easy for it to come out. This thing kind of like keeps it in place. And because you have the little bumps for the sprocket holes on both the inner part of the spool and then the outer tulips, that as it's wrapping around itself, it's gripping it really well. And when you rewind it, so let's say if you, I'm rewinding it now, I'm spinning it the other way, you just pull, it just pulls right out. Do you see how easy that came out? This thing is genius. And not only yeah. do I want one for myself, but I want to sell them. It's yeah. absolutely genius. I read uh, Johnny. I read your article, oh, and you. the and and as soon as as soon as I was like, I want, I gotta have, I gotta have some of those. So I'm I'm gonna connect with you about that uh, uh, very soon. I'm I'm envious that that Mike's got one. I can't wait to get my hands on one. I've been uh, shooting with them for quite a while. Actually, I found these guys uh, in like late November of last year, and just through some you know random eBay scrolling and 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 being up late and delirious <laughs> and i uh stumbled across their their reel i wrote to him i talked to him a little bit about it i, I bought one from them and uh, told him i was interested in you know reviewing it and these guys are just a little startup so they they 3d print all kinds of uh cool little gizmos for vintage cameras they're uh two guys based out of germany uh, the, the one uh they, they both went to school for engineering one guy um he uh was a bicycle mechanic so if that tells you anything like you know these guys are into like simple elegant solution sort of based tools somebody commented on your post they make replacement prongs for nikkor ai lenses yeah yeah they have a bunch of like weird little things you didn't think you might need but could come in handy maybe maybe mike you can drop a link uh when this is posted yeah i will but they, they have all kinds of cool stuff but anyway i so i i test it roll after i, I didn't want to st- you know this is a really exciting product to me because like i said i could start using my barnex more in a professional capacity than uh, you know I, I bring them with me sometimes and i just take a couple like you know I'll, I'll take like a roll or two but they're not sort of the centerpiece of what I, i'm doing most of the time but i think this is going to help me move them more into the forefront with my m6s because the idea is, is you know i can treat them more like rapid loading like like my m6s um, a lot of people say they don't you know shoot these kind of cameras to shoot fast but i think that you can find an appeal in them also just because you know for me like shooting film right like you the things you want to slow down about are you know being deliberate about like your exposure and your focus and your composition and things like that i don't think loading just getting the film into the camera is like something that need, you know that needs to be any like more difficult you know i, I you know i mean it's cool and all it's meditative yeah. I mean, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. But I, I don't need the film loading experience to be more difficult. And while I, I've i never subscribed to the I hate bottom loaders that some people do, I think many people blow it way out of proportion. It's not as hard as it some people say it is, but it is still more difficult. There is extra work involved. It's just extra steps. Right, right. And that's what, and for me, you know, this, this product eliminates that. And so I, I, I shot a number of roles. I, I think I mentioned it on the Petapixel article. I don't, uh, don't have the numbers in my mind anymore, but I, I did, you know, Mike tested some in his cameras and I, I tested them for months. I actually broke the first uh, version that they gave me and they revised it. They, they uh, thickened up the plastic and, and, and shored it up a bit more. And so I haven't, I, I've, I've shot more roles in the, uh, the new one than I have the old one now. I haven't had any breakages, haven't had any issues. 
I'm squeezing this with a good amount of pressure and it is not flexing at all. I mean, I, you really have to do something crazy, I think, to break this. But the one thing, and, and Johnny mentioned this in the article, but I will agree, this thing is very clearly 3D printed. It looks like a cheap piece of plastic, but it just works really, really well. So if you're, if you run into somebody who wouldn't dare put this 3D printed rough edged piece of plastic in their pristine Leicas, I, I could see some people not wanting to do that. But if you're, if it's definitely a photographer's tool. It's, it's not, it's not a collector's, but one of the things I said in the article is, you know, if you find yourself taking your vacation snapshots, whatever, on your cell phone, instead of the Barnack Leica you're carrying with you, this is the kind of product I think that's going to help you. Why am I using my cell phone when I have this beautiful vintage camera here? Oh, maybe it's because it's less convenient. This is going to help you make it more convenient to, to use the camera that you prefer, I think. Well, and, and I like anything in life that solves a problem, even if it's a minor one, in an easy way. If this thing's not complicated, the first time I used it, it worked perfectly. I did not have to fumble with it. It didn't break. And, and I appreciate things in life, true life hacks, things that are simple, easy, and cheap. And, and this pretty much checks off all three of those boxes. Dan, do you remember Luigi Crescenzi's stuff that he used to make for M6s? Oh, yeah. He made all kinds of different stuff for M6s. Well, he, he made the, the wonderful Leica time cases, the leather, handmade leather half cases for M6s. Oh, yeah. They're beautiful. He also had, he had two products that were just fantastic. One of them was called a slide, which was a piece of neutral density, sticky neutral density material that went over one of the rangefinder windows on the M6 to change the contrast. And so it lets you focus much easier in low light. Yeah, uh, because it was giving a, a contrast between the two windows. The other thing he made was called a scoop, which was just like a, a half a donut that fit over the, the the viewfinder window, and it kept him from scratching your glasses. I mean, it was just a fantastic. I mean, it were dirt cheap, but it was one of those things that you know, I, it just made it more enjoyable to use the camera because you were they were functional. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just like this, just like this take-up spool. Yeah, that's right. I've got a couple of scoops that I use all the time. Actually, I still I have a. I still I bought I bought a half dozen of them. I have one on my M2 and one on my M6 TTL. Yeah, I keep them. I keep them too. Robert, you've uh, been busy lately. How are things going with you? Yeah, it's going fine. I'm I'm keeping busy all the time. I got to get over to your place pretty soon. Yeah, you got to come back and. Uh... Yeah, I know. I know. I've got that. I've got that one wood camera. I have to return to you. Yeah, it's not a wood camera. I loaned it to Robert. Somebody took a Sony Alpha digital mirrorless camera and built a wooden shell. So they literally just slipped the camera inside of this wooden shell, but the wooden is is hand engraved to look almost exactly like a Nikon SP. Yeah. And so it has the original Sony E mount, but somebody put an S mount adapter on it. So it actually accepts Nikon rangefinder yeah. lenses, but it's it's a hundred percent a digital camera. There's a little window in the back for the rear LCD, and they lined up all the buttons on the wooden case that actually push the Sony buttons underneath. It's far out. Like I don't know who made something like that, but it's weird. I don't know if it was commercially made or not, but no, I'm sure it was. There's no way. I mean, it's handmade completely. I've never seen one before. I've seen one online with a Nikon S. This one looks like an SP. I've seen an S that was done. It was in Japan. It was all in Japanese, so I couldn't translate it. Maybe whoever made it just did one of each. Possible. So, all right. Well, Brock, you're there. Yeah, I know you said you, you love cameras and wanted to just join us, but what do you like to shoot? I'm a pretty big Argus fan. All right. Yeah, I'm I'm rocking my Michigan farm boy like that. <laughs> so Argus from Ann Arbor, you uh, you like shooting Argus cameras up there, right? I sure do. So at the Cincinnati show, Rick Olison showed up and uh, he was there not even two minutes. And he reaches down, he goes, look what I just bought. And he hands me an Argus A4. I think it was an A4R, but it had the Anawork uh, 50 millimeter F19 lens on it, which for Argus collectors, it's a really rare lens, very uncommon. And he, the guy had it sitting on a table. I think he paid like 30 bucks for it. I was like, damn it. <laughs> the, the guy was right next to me. Yeah, we didn't see it. And I, I don't know why I didn't see it. Because you sold one of those for what, $300 a couple years back? Yeah, yeah, just the lens. Just the lens. Now, uh, the one thing I'll say is it was jammed on the body. Uh, it was completely seized. So of anybody to pick up that camera, Rick Olison was the perfect person to get it because he's texting me that night. He's like, all right, I took this thing apart and I'm trying to clean it. 
get it, you know, un, unstuck. And he finally says to me, he's like, okay, I got it working again. I was like, cool. So I'm glad it went to someone who's gonna, gonna appreciate it. But yeah, that's cool. You you're from Michigan. I've gone up there many, many times and shot a lot of my American cameras. I usually like to bring, you know, something up there, a C3, one of the C4s. Uh, I shot my Argo Flex up in Michigan and the UP at Mackinac Island a couple times. It just feels like a kind of a homecoming for those cameras. Have you have you brought it to the museum? No, I've never been to Ann Arbor. I have never been to the uh, the Argus Museum. Oh, no. I want to go. But our our when we go, because I go up to northern Michigan often, but we're always coming up from like around Chicago. So we're going up through like Holland to Grand Rapids and straight north. I never get I never get to the east side of the state. Gotcha. I want to though. We were going to talk about a bunch of April Fool stuff. We we're going to have uh, go on about Kickstarter cameras that didn't ever pan out. But I, I kind of felt like this episode sort of transitioned into a like episode, which is fine. So our April Fool's joke is not to talk about April Fool's. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we did our, our dumb intro there. <laughs> but one one camera, I I, I was I, I wanted to come prepared because I felt like I had the perfect camera to talk about a Kickstarter that people were really excited about. And when it finally came out, people were just, I can't believe how much of a piece of crap this thing is. It was this Yashica, they called it the Y35 Digifilm camera. It, it looks sort of like a, a Yashica Electro. It's in an all plastic body. And the, the crazy thing about this one, they call it Digifilm. So you open up the back, uh, the, the film compartment, and in there are these little, we can see the batteries. There's two AA batteries. But it uses these ridiculous little, they look like APS, Advanix film cassettes. And all it is, is it has these little pins. And when you plug them in, it pushes down the pins in a certain way that essentially changes the mode of the camera. So I think they made a total of six of these cassettes. I have four of them. The one that's in there now puts it in black and white mode. There's one that emulates 200 speed color. I have one that emulates 1600 speed color. And I have another one that forces it to shoot square images, like like an SL, like a TLR or something. And I think they made two other like art ones, which I don't have. And this camera is, it's like 150 grams. P putting the batteries in almost doubles the weight of the camera. Uh, it's got like a Japanese optical, you know, fake lens. The serial number on every one of these is exactly the same. Like they just mass produce the bodies <laughs> the same. <laughs> thing it does have a film advance lever so you do wind it to cock the shutter and you press the shutter release to fire it so you can't press this unless you wind it it's got what looks to be an accessory shoe that's actually too small so it's not even a hot shoe if you tried to mount a modern flash to it it's not even the right size apparently they were going to make an led light accessory but it wasn't even a flash it was literally just a light that stayed on all the time that would help raise the light so the sensor could go. The viewfinder is just straight through plastic. I mean, there's no frame lines at all. It's just cheap plastic. This thing is the biggest piece of crap in the world. But then I shot it and I was like, wait a minute. Like, let me set the bar very low here. OK, they're not great. OK, but. They don't look nearly as bad as I thought they would. I sh I shared a couple of them in our private chat to Anthony and uh, Paul and Theo. I, I don't know. Like to me, they're like, it's like a cell phone. Like it's almost like they took a self and that's probably what they did. Honest. How, how else would you make a camera this shitty is to just take like an old, you know, 2014 surplus cell phone module put it inside a, a hollow plastic body with just barely enough electronics to add a trigger and an external shutter release and house it in a, a optical plastic fake lens but it does work and if when was it made you know when it was made <laughs> i'm sure it was made in china on mondays i didn't know yashika still use the name yashika on their cameras they still use yashika Oh, it's not. Oh, it's not Yashica. It's some some export company bought the rights to the name and put it on there. Like there's that new mirror list they're talking about that's that's got the Yashica name that's still coming out. So this thing was hyped to be the the return of Yashica. It looks if if I just held it way back here and said, hey, look, I got a new digital uh, Yashica Electro and then took it away. You'd probably be like, oh, show me more. I want to learn more about it. But the problem is it's eating into the M6 sales that Dan's trying to. That's right. <laughs> 
That's right. They're muscling in on my market. So they're mus- <laughs> So I, I like it, the, the reason I spent so much time on that is I was totally ready. I was fully prepared to trash on this thing of just how ridiculous the having to change the little cassettes in the back. It's I mean, you, I don't want to break it. But I mean, this plastic door, I mean, it wiggles. <laughs> I don't want to break it. Like, I mean, I, I could I could break it by blowing on it too hard. It is that cheaply made. I have two questions about this camera. Sure. Go ahead. The first one, the first one is, couldn't they just have put switches on the outside instead of making you put different cassettes oh, sure. on the inside? Absolutely. Right. But that's that's the experience though. The second one is, where did you find a bubble gum machine that's still working to buy that out of? It, it came. <laughs> I have the original box. It must have been a huge bubble gum machine. Uh, it was actually a big Kickstarter then. It was. It's cute. It is cute. I have a third question. How much is it? Is it is it, is it expensive? I don't think it's for sale anymore, but I think the Kickstarter was like 150. Okay. And, and and people were mad at that. And I would be too. I would not. Well, let me rephrase. If somebody told me there was a Kickstarter to get a new Yashica film digital camera and it only costs 150 bucks, I'd be like, no way. You know, I mean, that new, what's that new Rolly 35 that's being made? There's, they're estimating it's going to have a price. Oh, 35 AF. Yeah. There, it, there's, I think they're estimating the price to be somewhere around six to $700. Like that sounds reasonable to, to, to mass produce. And that looks like it's going to be a premium camera. It really does. A premium. But I mean, the, but the point is though, to make anything new from the ground up, I mean, no matter how popular film is, none of these cameras are going to sell anywhere near the numbers that they would have way back then. So it, no matter how successful, successful any of these kickstarters are they're still going to be niche products and when That's you right. make a niche product to scale it you just you need to raise the price to be able to physically just be able to make it so for for no matter how cheap this thing is i don't know that it can be made for much cheaper than 150 so in my opinion and i didn't i didn't fund this okay at all this just fell into my lap but i don't necessarily think that for 150 dollars you should have really expected much more than what you got but people were pissed about this you can go on google and just search for these and there's a whole bunch of just horrible reviews about them how cheap they are and it, they're right it's cheap but I think that it, my experience, and I've read a few other people who actually take the time to shoot it. It's like, eh, it's really not that bad. Like the images aren't that bad. You know, if you want a, like a, this is a Lomo camera, not made by Lomo. So uh, for yeah. that, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. So it's, it's the April Fool's prank is that the April Fool's camera is better than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the Yashica name trying to correct that? The people that have the Yashica name trying to correct that? Because uh, aren't they bringing out some sort of micro four thirds camera with some yeah, sort it's of a, tiny sensor? It's a mirrorless. They're making a new mirrorless. And I, I haven't learned, I don't know much about it. I've only seen a few pictures of it. I, 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 actually, I actually think there's an a article on Petapixel about that today, too. It, they collaborated with that company, I'm Back, that made the uh, the drop in, that's like right. the film fake. Yes, that's it. Not film, but digital cassettes that look like, you know, for old film cameras. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a more serious product. I just wanted to jump in. And, there's actually two points about this product that I think that is interesting. One thing is that I think, you know, there there's so many sort of products like this where people are trying to tap into the uh the the excitement in the film market and they're trying to make you know digital products or modern products of some sort that that tap into that and and i think i think that's you know however weird the the iterations of the you know end results are i, I think i think that's kind of cool i also think you know the film community we we gotta give people uh, you know there was a lot of uh backlash against this camera and 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 i'm i'm, I'm a big fan of the two uh Kodak Ektar H35 half frame cameras that have been released, the 35N, and uh, they're made by a, a, a Chinese company called Rito. I'm actually a big fan of those. I, I bought the first one, and then they sent me the second one to do a review on because uh, they did one on the first one. I, I really like these, and people complain about you know these plastic cameras and cheap cameras, and I, I think that we don't often appreciate how undervalued our classic cameras are you know we don't pay that much for a lot of them uh you know and so i think we have like sort of an unrealistic expectation of how much money it actually costs to produce these novel designs and, and especially when it comes to mechanical and film cameras 
take apart a roll of flex and just admire all of that action is being done on these tiny little gears and springs that some technician installed by hand. I mean, you're hundred percent right, Johnny. People don't appreciate how much technology has gone into this. We we had Bob Shanebrook on a number of episodes ago, and he made a comment that, that somebody said that the the amount of technology and effort that went into making Kodak film is one of the most impressive technological milestones of like mankind okay he was embellishing maybe a little being from kodak himself you know we went to the moon for christ's sake but the amount of effort that goes into making just film is is amazing you know kodachrome took 17 steps to develop there's so much technology and that uh a folding camera from the turn of the last century with a zeiss tessar lens and a compass shutter when cleaned, can still make images that, when scanned in a computer, rival that of digital cameras today. It's just mind-blowing. And without a doubt, my favorite part of this hobby. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm that that's that's one of my things too. Back to you know, we were talking about Argus earlier. One of the first cameras I, I learned to try to repair on my own before I decided I want to be a photographer, not a repair technician, was the Argus C three. Just the you know, the sort of elegant simplicity of those cameras because it's you know sort of like leica but a lot more basic and clunky i think maybe not as elegant but yeah you just i hate to say they don't make them like they used to but but they really don't and in the in the cases of uh companies trying to make them like they used to like the uh the roly 35 af you know i'm I've, I've been following mint for a long time you know who's making the roly 35 af they've t- uh, partnered with the uh, well, license license holders of roly for that camera and the the tl70 that they produced also they're doing some really cool stuff i i have the tl70 uh you know twin lens instax camera and they're doing really unique work that i think you know their cameras are you know on the uh, on the upper price range but there's just not a not a lot of options not a lot of mavericks out there doing this mechanical stuff anymore and i i I think it's cool i think we should definitely support that even if uh they've got some plastic components that we're not happy with (laughs) (laughs) i agree Uh, oh yeah i mean i i also sort of refer back to the the whole pentax thing where everyone's now grumbling oh they're they're being out of half frame but you know boohoo and so on but if you look at what they're trying to do is they're trying to tiptoe into the mark and do it right and build something, you know, like the quality. Uh, if they come out with a, you know, a four hundred dollar camera and it's, it's effectively a H thirty five Kodak, thing, then I, 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 you know, I'd say, okay, well, we got all that wrong. But from what I can see, is they're actually building, trying to build a quality camera. And what they've sort of realised is they can't go from go to, you know, bringing out the equivalent of, you know, a top SLR in one go. So they're, they're sort of, you know, looking at, you know, a half frame, they'll probably look at a compact and then move into an SLR. So it's, it's, it's to what your point, Johnny, it's, you know, that quality takes time, takes uh, workmanship, takes people that know what they're doing um, and comes at a cost. And it takes it takes us, frankly, because we're 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 the uh, we're the people that are gonna you know buy it or not buy it, right? So yeah, exactly. That's right. And if it's not for you, don't buy it. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, uh, it doesn't mean it's a bad product. The uh, the Kodak Super Eight is another sort of uh, in this in this category that I think a lot of people get really angry when they see how expensive it is, and you know they're like, you know, well, you could just m- mimic Super Eight on digital cameras, you know, why why this doesn't make any sense, you know, but I think you're right. It's it's about tiptoeing into that market. It's uh, they're trying to, they're trying to these companies they're trying to give us what we what we're asking for, and and we keep pushing back on them and saying no, that's not exactly what I want. I want exactly Exactly this. And- Anytime I've ever heard anybody online or in real life that says, well, why, what's the point of shooting film? Couldn't you just mimic it digitally? At that point, I, you can't engage any more conversation with someone like that. My, my one response is, you know what? You're right. That's it. I mean, it is. <laughs> if they believe that. We- and, you, and you know what? They are. It, it, it is what's good for them. They're, right. They are right. Yeah. So it, it's perfect for them. That's not the point, though, of why we do this. And someone exactly. who, who gives you that argument, it's just not worth, you know, it's like, you know what? You're right. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> So we're we're near the end here. Uh, does anybody have any questions or anything we haven't covered? 
Oh, just to, the, if you're going to dismantle a Roloflex to admire it, do you have to put it back together again? And does it have to work? Does it have to work after you get it back together? That's true. You could go on uh, YouTube and watch one of those videos of somebody <laughs> repairing it. Or, or, okay, better yet, like Chris Sherlock's uh, retina repair videos that he does. That's a, if you want to see a complicated camera at the inner workings, watch watch him taking apart a Retina Reflex 4 or something like that. <laughs> so um, this is episode 68. So uh, two weeks from today, we will record episode 69. We, we keep mulling in our private chat paul anthony and theo about what we're gonna do but we never decide what we're gonna do so let's let's make a decision gents what are we gonna do are we gonna do zeiss icon or are we gonna cover something else what what should we entice our listeners with to look forward to the next episode you know we did talk about doing cameras of de- decades decades that's right we did yeah so maybe do a 70s or an 80s do a 70s 80s 90s uh, not not in the same episode maybe but cameras of the 70s to start with all right, we will do that then. We will we will start instead of brand specific episodes, maybe talk about an era, you know, and and what were the highlights? We could talk about the uh, R3 again. <laughs> I mean, we got a lot, there are a lot of Mamias in there, Yashikas, you know, yeah. the, the the people's camera, you know, the cameras that uh, that you could buy in department stores. Well, and I like I like cameras from the 70s because you you were seeing a lot more electronics, you're seeing a lot more modernization, uh, more advanced cameras, the smaller SLRs were getting more popular, but it was still um, you know, autofocus hadn't really caught on yet. You know, the 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 80s was kind of a reboot for cameras for a lot of companies. You know, Minolta switched mounts, Canon switched mounts, Nikon, although they kept the F mount, they they changed their product lineup to me. Even, you know, I think, you know, just to, to very quickly tell Touch back on the the Leica R models. We were kind of humming and hawing over the R five, six, and seven, and those came out kind of in that era when there was a lot of you know movement forward of the industry. And and I think even companies like Lights had to figure out like what they wanted to do with their lineups too. You know, just to simply make a basic SLR with with no automation wasn't cutting it anymore for a lot of people. So I, there's I I think any decade honestly I I could sit here all day long and do an episode about the forties. I miss my 110. I want to bring back 110. Oh, God, Dan. <laughs> I have a crap load of it in the fridge still. Do so you really? I do. Yeah, it's been refrigerated. Supposedly it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the Pentax had a co-op at four or five lenses. The 110. Well, L- L- Lamogra- Lamography just released another 110 camera, didn't they? Did they really? Clearly, I've opened Pandora's box here. I bought a 110A with the Zoom. At uh, that show in Cleveland. I've got an Instamatic 60, a, a pocket Instamatic 60, and a 50 for that matter. I, I, bought, a, I bought a Leica 3A from Ray. I, I looked it up. It's a 1938 serial number. I was attracted to it. It didn't, the shutter was dead on it, but it had beautiful brassing. It had just that right amount of wear that I just loved the way it looked. I said the shutter was dead. It was tired. It, it, yeah, it was tired. It, 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 you could tell it had been previously repaired before. So I sent it out to Alan. To have them replace the whole thing so it's going to come back with a new new curtains timed uh the rangefinder i thought was accurate but maybe he could you know clean up the glass or something a little bit more but i'm looking forward to to giving that a go yeah mike by the way we're not supposed to mention the fact that if anyone needs a camera a mechanical camera repaired uh we're not supposed to say that Alan Wade at Camera Works in Waterford, New York, does great work because we don't want to tell people about him because then he would take longer to fix our cameras. We don't want to promote Alan Wade, W A D E, at Camera Works. Does he? Uh, does he work on CLs? I, I recently got a like a CL that needs something. He he'll do mechanicals, but I don't know if he could repair a meter. We can we can take care of the CL. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm not too worried about the meter. Oh, can you? Yeah, yeah, we can we can take care of that. Awesome, awesome. I'm gonna look up this Wade guy because I got some cameras that need repair. He does he does great work. He's an old fashioned repair man. I mean, he's no website. He has email. He'll send it back to you before you even pay. He'll like fix your camera, send it, send you a bill. Like yeah, he'll send it back. He sends you a bill. Just send him a check. Boy, I, I got some work for him. All right, guys, thanks for coming on. Dan, as always, awesome to have you on. Uh, Johnny, thank you for finally coming on the show. I hope you had uh, you enjoyed the experience. Absolutely. Uh, Brock, Brock, it was a pleasure to meet you. You know, um, I, I my our Desert Island episode we did many, many ago, I brought up the Argus C3 as one of the cameras I love. Such a simple but but ugly 
in a beautiful way camera that just that shoots really nice pictures patrick casey ray mark it's always good to have you on bob it's awesome to see you again as always the topics and discussions on the camerosity podcast are influenced by you so we will start an episode talking about one thing and you never know where it's going to go so join us on a future episode in two weeks from today which this show hasn't even aired yet but two weeks from today is, is april 15th we'll be recording a show about cameras from the 70s uh have a great night everybody and uh, see you next time good night thanks y'all take care thank guys right, thanks good night Hey, everyone. Uh, um, Mike, Mike. Yeah. Could you have been recording this? I thought you were recording. Ah! <laughs> April Fool's. <laughs> April Fools. Oh, heart attack. April Fools. <laughs> April Fools. <laughs> All right. <laughs>